The reading this morning is from um, the Gospel of Luke, starting in, um, in chapter 11, starting at verse 14. And that can be found on uh, page 1043 of the Church Bibles. Luke chapter 11, starting at verse 14. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others test him by asking for a sign from heaven. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Let's pray. Lord, take my words and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We live in uncertain times. We have the possibility of a snap general election upon us, I've heard in the news this morning. And you may be relieved or saddened to hear that I'm not going to address such weighty matters in this sermon. I take heart from the words of Bishop Graham Tomlin, who wrote in the Times a few weeks ago, that if you're on a ship and you feel seasick, that the best advice is to look away from the ship towards the horizon. And if you look at some distant point away from the turbulence in front of you, that may help you feel a bit better. And I I think that's exactly what we do when we meet to worship, as we're doing now. And not least when we open the scriptures and ponder their meaning. Now in recent weeks we've been looking at a range of passages from Luke's Gospel. And I'd encourage you to find in the Bibles in, in your chairs um, to find the passage that Fiona's kindly read for us. It's Luke chapter 11 and it starts at verse 14. It's on page um, 1043 of the church Bibles. Now you can see it starts, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. Jesus heals someone unable to speak And this affliction is ascribed to the man having a demon. Now the average Westerner may stir uneasily at this point. Healing? Sounds good. Demons? Hmm. We need a little ground clearing. A personal comment. I am not in any sense an expert on this subject. I certainly think that when we talk about devils, the demonic, Satan, we should do so with very great care. 
there are many ways in which that language gets misused. Yet it's there in scripture and it shouldn't be dodged. We should also note that it is rare in the New Testament for illness to be linked to the demonic. Indeed, there are a wide range of church leaders in the New Testament who fall ill, like Paul and Timothy, and they are, that is never ascribed to anything but the, them being ill. We should also note that if talk of evil and Satan make us squirm, we might ponder the last hundred years in which more people have been killed by other people than in any century in history despite us being wealthier than in any other century in history. I think it's well said that if there is no devil, then there is certainly someone around doing his work. And beyond this, there is the notion of the psychosomatic, which is an explicit recognition that the bodily and the non-bodily affect each other. We may struggle to understand this, but they do. Now in saying all of that, that's a kind of throat clearing. Because as you can see from verse 15 in the passage, most of the passage is in fact not about the healing, but about the healer. For in verse 15, skeptics in the crowd say, by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he, that is Jesus, is driving out demons. And Jesus vigorously responds, that this is nonsense. Satan is the power that afflicts, and it is Satan that is dethroned by healing. The skepticism deserves to be treated with skepticism. And then in the passage we get to verse 22, and I take this as the heart of our passage. Sorry, verse 21 and verse 22. Jesus says... A short parable to the crowd. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. Now I think this is the heart of the passage. A strong man guards his house, but someone stronger overpowers him and carries off the spoils and this is in response to that healing and what Jesus is saying is that in the parable the first strong man is Satan the embodiment of evil the someone stronger is Jesus himself in Jesus healing of the dumb man in all his other healings and exorcisms in his teaching and in his miracles Here is almighty strength, almighty power coming into our world, dethroning the powers that would be. Here is the true Lord before whom all lords will one day bow. Now as we think of Jesus, we rightly stress service and weakness and the way that permeates the Gospels and the entire New Testament. Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Jesus powerless on the cross. Jesus poor to make us rich. This is absolutely right. This is central to the Gospel. But this is only part of the Gospel. And in this passage, Jesus embodies not weakness but strength. And he is coming to take power. In this passage, Jesus, the strong man, is giving notice that he is coming to rule. We are in the middle of Lent. We're on our way to Good Friday and Easter Day. And the cross is, of course, power perfected in weakness. But make no mistake, it is power. The one whose life appeared worthless is acting as ransom for the lives of us all. The one crucified in utter weakness is going to be raised in glory. And it is Easter day when the strength of God is made wholly manifest as he raises Jesus from the dead. I've been rereading the book of Acts lately 
Acts is also written by Luke and it effectively is the sequel to Luke's gospel. And what struck me rereading Acts is how often when the first Christians speak of faith, they reference the resurrection of Jesus. That's the kind of go-to aspect of the gospel for them. It's absolutely central to what they say. And they're saying that this Jesus who looked weak on the cross is stronger than anything else in creation. And Easter Day shows it. I was moved by some words by a second century Christian called Tatian. He was writing in a context where persecutors had burnt the bodies of Christian martyrs in Lyon, that's from France, and then thrown the ashes in the River Rhone, all in an effort to mock and undermine the Christian's hope of resurrection. And Tatian said this, Even though fire should destroy my flesh, even though I should be dispersed through rivers and seas or torn in pieces by wild beasts, I am gathered up. In the treasuries of a wealthy Lord. And when he pleases, God, who is king, will restore the substance that is visible to him alone into its original condition. Here is a rock solid trust in the resurrection. And if those circumstances sound extreme, we might remember that both, both that. Not only did early Christians face that fate, but not a few Christians face uh, similar persecution in our own day. Now this way of thinking makes us see the cross differently. The cross happens because of human decision. The scheming of the leaders in Jerusalem, the indifference of Pilate, the callous apathy of the crowd. But it also happens because Jesus wills it. He accepts his death, not to my will but yours, he says. On the cross, however weak Jesus may look, here Christ, the strong man, takes on the power of Satan. Where evil seeks to reign, it is faced down. Jesus walking, staggering to Golgotha, submits to evil, literally weighed down by it. But he chooses to do so. He is slave of no earthly power, no law, no custom, no institution. He takes up the cross. It is not thrust upon him. As we read through the Gospels, we are continually asked, who is this man? And this passage tells us that when we, that we meet in Jesus, the one who is stronger than Satan. This passage and indeed the Gospels are like the trailer for the main feature, which is Easter Day. There we meet Jesus the Omnipotent, Jesus who will win out on Calvary. As we continue through the passage, we can see in verse, from verses 23 onwards, we see how we are to respond to the strength of Christ. In verse 23, Jesus says, he who is not with me is against me. Now, this is a verse that needs careful consideration more than there is time for today. But what it does remind us of is that to follow Christ is to be responsive. We have to actively want to be with Jesus. It's not automatic. We need to respond. No one is forced into relationship with Christ. Then in verses 24 to 26, we see the need to be filled. Jesus tells the story of a man with an evil spirit. The spirit is ejected, it wanders off, then it comes back. And the house is empty, so it moves right back in. And says Jesus, the condition of that man is worse than the first. When we turn to Christ, we need this renewing spirit to fill us. We need to be filled with the Spirit, permeating every part of us. This is about positive change. For whilst being a Christian does involve ending some behaviours, it is mainly about starting other behaviours. Having mouths filled with thanksgiving and encouragement, not with moaning and criticism. Using money with generosity, not with meanness. Only by the Holy Spirit filling our lives can we begin to do so. 
We need to be responsive, to be filled. And then thirdly, in verses 27 and 28, we need to be obedient. Someone in the crowd cries out to Jesus, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And Jesus replies, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Following Jesus who is strong means letting that strength be manifest in the way we live. As we obey God's word, the strength of Christ is conducted through our lives to the lives of others. Called to be responsive to God, to be filled with the spirit, to be obedient to his word, we will then start to be victorious in our lives. No longer slaves to the opinions of others, fear of mortality, fear of failure. We will stand tall in the strength of the risen Christ. Where do you need strength? Perhaps you need strength to love somebody who, frankly, you find rather unlovely. Perhaps you need strength not to let Brexit hysteria make you depressed. I I have a feeling we all need strength for that one. And perhaps you need strength to face illness or bereavement. We are weak. But Jesus is still Lord in the midst of our weakness. We are weak bodily and mentally, but we have Jesus who has gone before us and with us into pain and death. In these uncertain times, particularly, we need strength to speak peaceably of others, most especially of those with whom we disagree. What has been your speech? And I mean just not your verbal speech, but your online speech. Are you for Brexit? Do not scorn Remainers. Are you for Remain? Do not scorn Brexiteers. Let the strength of Jesus' love permeate us, and that means our words as much as our actions. We meet on Sunday, the day of Christ's resurrection. And from earliest times, Christians have seen every Sunday as in some sense a celebration of Easter. Now, whether that means we should have Easter eggs every Sunday, I I leave for you, you to decide. But it does mean that every Sunday we reconnect with the strength of the God that raised Jesus from the dead. We are weak, but he is mighty. Remember that. We are weak, but he is mighty. We are weak, we are drawn to sin like moths to a flame. But he is stronger than Satan, stronger than everything we will face in our lives this week. Let us trust ourselves to the strength of Christ and live in that resurrection hope. Amen.